when we're thinking about the grief of sex, I think really being able to take your time. I think when you understand yourself as a sexual person, then you know, okay, this is what I need and this is what I don't need. What's up, YouTube fam? This is your girl, Lauren Denise, host of this Tisha Suck podcast, A Fresh Respect on Grief, back with another episode. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about the grief around sex or the grief of sex, however you want to say it. But I have an amazing sex education therapist on. Her name is Marla Renee Stewart. And we are talking about the grief of sex from so many different angles. We not only talk about the taboo topic and how the grief surrounding sex, we also talk about how people use sex as a coping mechanism uh, during their grieving process, how some people really struggle with it during their grieving process. We also talk about the grief that can be created without having the education around sex and sexuality. We just talk about so many different things and actually it's a really, really enlightening episode. So as always, leave a comment, let me know what resonated with you the most. I can't wait to talk to you guys after the episode and I hope you all enjoy and get some new knowledge around the taboo topic of sex. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. (laughs) Welcome back my loves to another episode. If this is your first time here, welcome. If you are coming back, welcome back my loves. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you guys so much for being here. So today we're going to be diving into the grief of sex, baby. So you're probably like, Lauren, what are you even about to talk about? (laughs) And you know what's so funny is I've been wanting to do this. Like when I first wrote down topics for my podcast, like, you know, if you guys have followed me on social media enough, or I think I maybe said it here, you know, this kind of, this wasn't my vision. Like, you know, God really gave me this vision and I just started writing down all these topics. One of the topics was the grief around sex. And I didn't know how I wanted to surround it. I knew I wanted to talk about it from the perspective of why it's such a taboo topic. Why have we kind of demonized it in the way that we have, instead of being, uh, more, uh, talking about it from a more, um, education standpoint, right? Um, And, you know, how we use it as a unhealthy coping mechanism, right? Because I've shared before, and I'll share again in an interview, um, I brought on an amazing, amazing sex education therapist. Her name is Marla Renee Stewart. And she's going to be um, talking about, you know, just so many different layers that have to do with the tabooness of sex, the uh, how we can kind of create a grief within ourselves with it. Um, you know, how some people like, again, how we use this uh, unhealthy coping mechanisms. But then she did have to, she, she broke it down so eloquently of how it cannot be unhealthy, uh, but it can be also healthy in the same sense. Right. Um, and, and just also like, if you're Some people don't, you know, some people are like, I can't even think of intimacy. I can't even think of sex. Right. She talks about that. Um, And then we also talk about, you know, if you're uh, if you're losing kind of the intimacy with your spouse or a partner, you know, how you can kind of get that back and and what that looks like. So um, just such an amazing episode, because, you know, when I was going through my grieving process, I'll say specifically with my mom, um, I think I've shared this before, but I definitely had like two. I'll say outlets. I had two outlets, um, you know, guys who I would just call me like, hey, I need you to come through. You know, when I would start feeling sad or when I would start feeling anxious or when I would start um, feeling uh, just like feeling feelings that I didn't know how to process at the time that I didn't recognize, you know, were grief and I needed to process it. Like I would just call them, you know, we would have sex and I would just ask them to leave. And, you know, I was good in that moment. And then the next day it came back and I'm like, okay so that feeling of sadness is still here now what cool you got your rocks off cool story but like you know um and then you know also just talking about it from perspective y'all know that i'm a christian you know i subscribe to christianity y'all know um you know i believe in the father son holy spirit y'all know i'm i'm like you know kind of churchy like y'all know that right but um you know, how we didn't, like, it was just like abstinence and and things like that. And I wish that sometimes my parents would have um, educated me a little more because a lot of things I did growing up, um, you know, when it came to sex and sexuality, I kind of learned either through pop culture or through friends, um, you know, and I didn't really, and I never like went to my parents, like, you know, funny story is I never told my parents that I had sex. 
I never told him I lost my virginity. Like, cause that just was like, we never had a conversation about sex. The only conversation we had was abstinence, uh, purity. Like I had a purity ring from church. Like, you know, like we never really talked about it. And so when I did lose my virginity, um, I was, uh, in high school, I was, it was my junior, I was 17 and, uh, you know, it, it hurt. Like nothing about it, like made me want to be like, yeah, I want to do it again. I was like, is this what people was waiting on? This crap hurts and it doesn't feel good. <laughs> like I was over, it. but the person who I was with, I was like, oh, that is bang, you know? So, you know, we, we kept trying, but I was like, bro, this is not enjoyable at all. You know? And I wish that I would have been able to go to my mom and be like, mom, like, you know, this is, this is what happened. Like, it doesn't feel good. I don't know how you and dad do it. You know what I mean? Like, cause that could have really severely uh, turned it off. And, and it did for a while. I was like, I don't want to have sex with nobody. Cause that crap hurts. I don't know why people acting like it's good. Cause by that time, a lot of my friends had already done it. You know, I was, I, I was apparently late to the game at 17, but you know, um, I was just like, bro, this is not it. And so I wish I would have been able to uh, have that conversation with them. But, uh, so anyways, I say that to say that one day my dad sent me and my older sister down and was like, I know y'all are having sex. And like, literally y'all, y'all should have seen me. It was a mess. I was like, can he smell it? Is it like a sex smell on me? Is it like pheromones? Like, <laughs> like immediately started freaking out i'm like how does he know do i look a certain type of way do i smell a certain type of way like how does he know you know and i just and and that was like the conversation that we had about sex he was just like you know be safe um you know use protection like you don't want to have kids you know just like and that was really like the extent of the conversation but i wish we just would have had more um conversation around it especially like the emotions that can be involved with it um, you know, things that can happen if you don't protect yourself, just, you know, what happens if uh, emotionally you're in a place and you kind of use it in a sense of, uh, again, just trying to cope or, you know, you really enjoy it at one point and just are like out there in these streets. And and we talk about all this in the interview as well. So I'm just going to I do get vulnerable and I I don't tell you guys about my sex life, but I am like honest about some things that I've did, um, because I think, again, that's the whole point of this podcast, right, is being vulnerable and to help people who may have been in the same situation of like, you know, I do desire to get married and things like that. And I'm looking at a perspective of like, what did my husband ask me? you know, how many partners I've slept with, which I think is weird, which we talk about that too. You know, like, is he going to, and there was a phase in my life where, you know, I was, I was out here. Your girl was out here in these streets. Right. Um, you know, how do I talk about that? Right. And, 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 and why the, the, the stigma is around it in the Western culture, I'll say specifically as much as it is and what those conversations need to be. If you have children growing up, because if you don't have those conversations, guess who's going to have them? Pop culture. Guess who's going to have them? Lil Wayne, G, all these people going to have those conversations. They're friends, they're friends with older siblings. So like you need to be equipped to be able to have these conversations. So I'm really excited for you guys to hear this conversation. Y'all already know how it goes. Definitely about to get into this break. But as soon as we come back, we're going to get into this wonderful conversation about the grief of sex. All right, guys, we are back. And I'm super, super excited for this topic. Y'all know I've been ready to talk about this. And I know y'all been like, well, how are you going to talk about it? Y'all know I was going to bring it up and it was going to be wonderful. So I'm going to read her bio and we're going to get right into it. Marla Renee Stewart, MA, is a sexologist, coach, and author who runs her own sexuality education company, Velvet Lips, and also a co-founder of the Sex Down South Conference. She has studied human sexuality for more than 20 years and has given over 500 workshops all over the world. She also has been featured on a variety of media outlets, including Netflix Sugar Warning with Killer Mike and Love and Hip Hop Atlanta. She co-wrote her first book, The Ultimate Guide to Seduction and Foreplay with Dr. Jessica O'Reilly, which debuted in April of 2020. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome the beautiful Miss Marla. Hey, girl. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes. No, I'm excited to have you here because of course, again, like people are probably looking at this like, <gasps> sex, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Because that's what it is. Again, another taboo topic, just like with grief. But that's why I wanted to kind of dive into it from a few different angles of 
you know, how we use grief and unhealthy coping mechanisms, because that's definitely what I did, how it can kind of be hard, uh, you know, after a loss. And then why is it such a, uh, uh, I don't want to say like a bad thing, but like, why have we created this stigma of what sex is and it's bad and all these different things in society. And so uh, my first question to you, I know it says you've done it over 20 years, but how did you get into this field to be able to talk about this? Because I'm sure a lot of people are like, I like sex. I could talk about it. But like, how did you really get into the sex education field? Yeah, I started back in college, you know, uh, sexuality has always been something that interested me. Um, you know, uh, even as a teenager, I remember in middle school being like, I want to be a stripper when I grow up, you know, like I was just kind of, I really enjoyed seduction and I just saw like what it does to people. And, um, and so then in college I just studied, uh, sexuality and then my friends were coming to me for sex advice. And that's pretty much how it got started. I was like, Oh, I'm kind of good at this thing of giving people really great sex advice them following it, them coming back for more or whatever. And, um, that was really, uh, that was really helpful for me to really determine like, Hey, actually this is good for me. I love this. I love talking about sex. I mean, and I love helping people and healing p people. So what better way to do that than to do this? So, uh, that's how I got started. And then when I got into graduate school is when I actually started my business and, uh, you know, you know, figured that by the time I got my graduate degree, I would be ready to be out in the world. And, um, so yeah, so that's pretty much how, you know, this came about. Yeah, no, I love that. So I want to uh, talk about something you, you talked about, like it's healing, right? And so when people, I'll say, you know, because of the, the society way that we talk about sex, people don't think about it as being something that's healing, right? So can you talk about that a little bit when you say it could be healing for them? Like, what do you mean when you say that? Well, you know, a lot of times people it start off where sexuality is demonized or they're have feeling shame or stigma, or even that, you know, they have been uh, in, you know, sexual traumatic situations as young people. So sometimes they don't get the things that they really need to have a really great flourishing sexual life, you know, and be sexually responsible. Um, things like lack of sex education or, you know, um, ha having family or caretakers that, you know, tell you not to do this or don't even talk about it um, can really do damage not only to the psyche, but can do damage to your sexual health. So sexual health, mental health are all related. Um, so mm -hmm. when it comes to healing, it's sort of like you need to be able to understand, hey, what is it that I might be lacking or missing or how can I talk through maybe a situation or work through a situation that would be beneficial for me. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, sexuality is healing, um, more or less too, because the hormones that we get from sex, right? Serotonin, right. oxytocin, dopamine, endorphins, all of these things are good for us. So it, sex is good for us just by way of, um, the hormones and the things that we get from, from doing it. Yeah, no, I love that. Like you said, me sexual health and mental health are connected because of course, again, and, and so I want to talk about that because obviously this is, you know, a podcast about grief. Let's talk about the grief surrounding just like sex as a whole and, and why it has become demonized. I'll say in Western society, because I know in some other countries, you know, they are sex positive and, and we have become really kind of sex negative and like abstinence and don't do it as opposed to educating. So, you know, I want to talk about that, like how we've kind of created this grief around sex in our Western culture. Like, where did that kind of come from? And, and how do we, I guess, how do we fight that if we even can? You know, with our, you know, with the U.S. or, you know, it's, it's really, um, it's very funny, right? Because we think about like, oh, like we've been taught since the Victorian era, like sex is bad, don't do this. And um, we really have, um, 
we really because it, it didn't used to be like that right before um so it, it's sort of we go through these periods of where sex is bad and the the interesting part is we use we use sex to sell everything, right? Literally so, everything, everything, hamburgers, anything. <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, it's like uh, social media channels or things are really like you can't say this or you know different you know avenues will tell you you can't use this word or you can't do that. So it's it's fascinating to see how like um, we really how we play. I mean, pornography is billions and billions of dollars. Pornography itself makes more money than like Disney, Comcast, you know, oh, wow. all of those big corporations combined. You know what I mean? Oh, wow. Um, but it, it's, it's fascinating to know that like, you know, <laughs> We, we, we want it hidden, right? We, we don't want it to be out. We want it's so taboo that we have to keep it hidden and underneath. And so people are, um, and that's why you have like sometimes a lot of like religious leaders that, you know, or be like, I was addicted to porn. And it's like, well, yeah, because if you're shutting down that part of you constantly, it's going to come out in some way and it's not going to, it's going to manifest itself in an ugly way rather than in a healthy way. So um, I, you know, I think this part of what you're saying about grief is, is really, uh, it, it's sort of like we, we, we just don't deal with it <laughs> the way that we should be dealing with sex, you know? Um, but a lot of that is, like I said, it's, 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 um, through our caretakers. A lot of that is through, our history through our families, um, we learn not to do certain things. And uh, once we break those old patterns, I think that's when the healing can really, you know, begin. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it, you know, it, for everyone who's listened, they know, like, you know, I subscribe to Christianity and, you know, growing up it was abstinence, you know, purity rings, you know, things like that. And, and I was telling my sister recently, I wish that my parents had had a conversation with me, educating me on sex, because I feel like a lot of the decisions that I made as an adult sexually, like I was just doing because I didn't have education on it. And I wish that, you know, I would have had more understanding of what happens when you do this or what happens if this happens, because emotionally it can really cause turmoil. So like, can we talk about that a little bit? How, and, and maybe it, it goes back to that mental health, how sex can emotionally do some things to you if you don't know how to, I'll say steward it, right? Right? Like how can that emotionally cause turmoil in your life? Cause I can talk about it all day, but I'd like to talk to the expert. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, sex is one of those, it's one of those raw carnal things, right? Is it's in our biology. It's in our, it's how we move, right? It's how we help to, uh, recreate other human beings. It's how we use that energy to, um, do things in our everyday life. Right. And when we think about sex, we, it's in everything. So when we, in psychology, you know, we call it a uh, sublimation, right? Where, you have that sexual energy, but where do you put it out? And so some of us put it out in healthy ways where we might go um, channel it in our work or channel it in our family or channel that energy elsewhere. Um, but when you don't, um, when you don't harness that energy, um, it can be, it can be really taxing on you. Right. So, you know, there's like, um, you know, back in the day when people went to work, um, <laughs> like, like, you know, that thing, you know, when they, when they go to the, the job, um, right. uh, you know, a lot of times people in, and back when, before sexual harassment was huge, right. People would be like, Oh, you must be in a bad mood. Right. Cause you must not have gotten laid or, you know, you, you need to get laid in order to, cause you got oh, to need some, we just need some dick. She'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> 
Right. And I mean, and part of it is true. It's because if we don't take care of ourselves and whether that's through masturbation or having sex with someone else, if we don't take care of our needs, the, the, we don't get those happy hormones. We don't get the serotonin, the oxytocin, the dopamine, the things that we need to, to function well. So and things that we need to, to, to feel good. So, um, I think, you know, we really have to take care of ourselves, um, in that way of, yeah, of just being able to, uh, to do it. <laughs> yeah. Release. Yeah. Kind of release those, um, uh, those, like you said, those, uh, emotions and things. And so, I want to talk about that a little bit because, again, going back to just not knowing growing up, like just learning to not do it, but not really understanding if you do it, this is what could happen. You could get, you know, STDs, you can get pregnant, you can get all types of stuff, right? Um, you know, of course, in sex ed, they give you speedy the sperm and, you know, and they show you like, horrible pictures of chlamydia and horrible, you know, all of this crazy stuff. Right. But if you tell someone not to do something, children, especially, of course, they're, you know, probably going to peak their mind to do it. Right. Um, and so then things happen, you know, um, you may get an STD or somebody may break your heart or you have sex with someone, you're a virgin, and now they don't talk to you anymore and you feel some type of way. Like, how do you, so maybe the question is like, what are the conversations around that? Like, you know, this is a way you can kind of get away from that. Yeah. Well, I think part of it is we need to have better comprehensive sex ed, right? Um, like here in the South, there's abstinence only sex ed, which is not going to get people very far. It, it means that there's higher STD rates here. Um, it means that people aren't, you know, they're not doing the things they need to do because they're not educated around it. Right. We don't, a lot of times people are like, oh, condoms, condoms. Yeah. But condoms, you know, are just one thing out of a bunch of different things that can help, you know, to provide barriers, um, for, for birth control and, and for STD. So, um, I think we don't have a, a grip on uh, relationships. What do healthy relationships look, look like? Mm -hmm. I get so many inquiries about like, well, what is a healthy relationship? Because sometimes uh, I've had couples come to me and I'm like, you're, what you're doing is abusive. You know, do you know oh, wow. that is abusive? And so like people don't understand like uh, when they are, when they are being abusive or when they are being abused. Um, because they haven't had good models um, as far as healthy relationships. Um, uh, talking about communication skills. Um, a lot of times if you are, you know, born female, um, you know, if you're socialized as female, you end up talking a certain way. You end up having indirect speech. Um, so there's like lots of these communication style patterns, I think that also need to be taught or should be taught. Um, to people as young people, right? Like having direct communication instead of having people guess what you mean, right? You know what I mean? Right, um, right. Understanding what an orgasm is. I, I still have people coming to me like, I've never had an orgasm. I don't know what it feels like. What? It, how can you describe it? And it's like, I can't describe what an orgasm feels like. A lot of people just can't <laughs> right. describe that feeling. You know, you're like, right. hmm. It's like you're simulating yourself and then you come to like a crescendo, but then you get and it's just like, and then right. magic. And then but sometimes <laughs> orgasm. Then you just small. feel good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, like sometimes you have to understand orgasms are small. Sometimes they're ginormous, right? Like there's that um, understanding, like you said, the emotional aspect of it. Um, sometimes people get attached when they have sex because of that oxytocin hormone. It's, a, it's our bonding hormone. Mm. So when you are, uh, if you don't understand like your um, emotionality, if you don't have that emotional intelligence and you can go into a sexual situation thinking like, oh, okay, I'm going to have sex for the first time. What do, you know, what can I expect? And some people think like, oh, um, oh, I'm just going in to, to just have sex. And then really feeling like, oh my gosh, I feel really deeply about this person, this person, mm. they, they, they knew my body in ways maybe I didn't know that was possible. Yeah. So having that understanding yourself emotionally, right? Also being mentally and physically ready 
So um, a really good way that I thought my mom was really helpful in this aspect was she told me um, when you're ready to have sex or when you go to the store and buy condoms, that's when you know you're ready to have sex. Mm. And so for me, it was the mentality was, okay, I'm not ready to have sex. But then, you know, I had this boyfriend and I'm like, okay, I think I'm ready to have sex now. So I went to the store, I bought condoms and it was like, my heart was, you know, racing a mile a minute, (laughs) you know, but I was like, okay, but this is the step. My mom said, this is a step that I need to take towards if I'm going to have sex. So this is a step that I'm taking. And even though it was nerve wracking, I did it. You know, we, we were both, um, we were both having sex for the first time together. So it was just kind of like, you know, also having him have that experience with me was, is, was great. Cause we both are like, okay, this is, this is what it is. Um, and so I really, uh, that I definitely appreciated because it, and I understood, okay, mentally I'm ready. Physically I feel ready. Um, and a lot of times we don't get that in our sex education or our caretakers don't explain like how, like, I don't know anybody else that, uh, that have has said something like that or that whose parents has said something like like what my, my mom parents said would never my you parents know? would never <laughs> and you know and my mom she was real she was a teenage mom so she wasn't gonna be like wait until marriage like she was just like no because that's not what happens you know right, like, I know I what it's like to get girl, horny girl. And I know what it's like to have sex and I know what it's like to have sex and get pregnant, like, you know, as a teenager. So I'm not going to, you going to do it. Right. It's hard. <laughs> She's like, it's hard. And I don't want you to go down that route like that I took. I want you to be better. So I'm going to equip you with the information you need to be better and to be a more sexually responsible adult. And so, you know, that's the, that's, those are the things that we need to do. So whether it's caretakers or, you know, a mentor or someone that you have in your life to sort of guide you, um, I I think is great. Now we have the internet now, you know, we have, uh, people are watching porn. So a lot of times teenagers, um, I had a guy on my radio show the, uh, on Monday that was talking about, how he's he his teenager his teenage boy asked if he if it was okay to watch porn and it was like you know he was like well yeah because i just don't want him to go and have sex with someone and and make a baby or whatever and i'm like yeah but did you give him some porn literacy because at 13 when you start watching porn guess what your penis is going to start to fail you in your early 20s and 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 mid 20s because it's going to be a it's it's a problem i I, i've had people come to me that are like my penis isn't working anymore but i've been watching porn since i was you know 10 11 12 13 oh wow and so porn literacy we need to have that because you know even when we were younger uh, when i was younger i'm not gonna speak for you but when i was younger (laughs) you know we had the turn dial tv right the click 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 tv and so, you know, you would have those premium porn channel. You knew it was a porn channel, but you would like try to click it, you know, cl- click like halfway just to see. If the porn- so, you know, like young people are going to try to watch it. So it's right. a matter of how are you telling them about it, letting them know this is entertainment. Hey, if you're going to masturbate to this, guess what? It's going to zap your brain uh, to your genitals. It's going to do a lot of things. So having these understandings, I think, is going to be the way to go. But if we don't have those things and we're not equipped, we're going to have a real problem. Yeah, no, that's really good because I'm cracking up because there was <laughs> this is I listen, I'd be very transparent with y'all. Y'all do not judge me. But like <laughs> there was a the, 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 what was it called? I think it was called like the Spice Channel or something. And you can only hear the music and the, the, it was real like it was real staticky. Okay, and every time I would hear my parents, I would like try and change it real quick, and I'm like, I know they know, <laughs> like, I know they know what's going on. Like, you know, I know they know what's going on in here, but you couldn't see, like you said, you can barely see it a little bit. But you know, I didn't even think about that. You know, 
like you said, you've been doing this for so long and now here you are trying to have a healthy relationship and you can't get it up because you've been, you know, masturbating for so long and every day since you were 13, like now you got an issue. Well, masturbating's you know I mean? okay. Masturbating to porn all the time, not okay, right? Because yeah. you start to bond with the screen. I had one guy who oh. masturbated seven to eight hours a day with porn, and then he was oh having God. trouble. I know he worked from home. This and this was back like, before people like, worked from home. I got no job. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But he was having a hard time bonding with people because he was just like, I don't, I can't, my my penis will not. And I'm like, because you've you formed a relationship with your screen and now yeah. you're you're having a hard time being realistic in, in what a real person is and feels like and, and whatnot. So I'm not saying oh, porn wow. is bad. I'm just saying you need to be able to have a healthy relationship with porn um, if you're going to use it and understand yeah. what that That's- looks like. Yeah. And most, and most people I know do not have a healthy relationship with it. So (laughs) y'all probably need some education with that. Uh, Because you know what it is, because, you know, I think that what happens is, is they, uh, like you said, because it's acting, you know, that's essentially what it is, is they're acting. And so like you go and try and live this out in real life. And when it doesn't uh, meet the expectations of what's happening in this quote unquote show or movie, now you're like, oh, well, it's like, well, yeah, like this person is acting like you, you can't just like randomly go into a, a, I don't like a cab and just like go touch on your cab driver. And now you in jail and you're confused as the like you can't, you know, what I'm saying? like you that's not it's not how the real world works. So <laughs> I, I think that's it, that is important that, you know, to, is to educate yourself. And so I want to dive into that a little bit. So um, uh, most of my audience is millennials. And so, you know, we grew up in, like you said, kind of a, a era of either sneaking or abstinence or whatever. And so, you know, we all will, let me, again, let me not speak for everybody. Me personally, I did have a whole face and I don't even know if it's called a whole face as much as it was just me kind of, um, because I was told, nope, you can't do it. Of course, kind of uh, in a rebellious spirit, going out and, and you know, having a lot of sex with guys and, and doing these different things, right? Um, almost as an act of rebellion. And so now I look back and I'm like, oh my God, like, Lauren, like, why were you doing that? And so it's kind of caused this grief within myself to say like, now it doesn't bother me as much because I do have a desire to get married. And I think it's weird when people ask you how many people you slept with me personally but i'm like what if my husband does ask me that and now i gotta go through the gambit and be like well there was a time in my life where you know sis was out here you know so like how do we reconcile with that because again i think maybe it just has become this thing with society of like whoo she got a whole bunch of bodies she's she's a hoe right so like how do we reconcile with that and move forward in our life knowing that maybe this was a phase in our life that we just were we was out here (laughs) well i mean I don't know, because even though it might be a hoe phase or whatever, maybe you're just a hoe, like, and then, right. you, and then you're just, you know, that's okay. You know, I, right. I, I right. think we put too much emphasis on that. Um, mm. Because honestly, I, I, I think if you have, you know, however many bodies, maybe you have a hundred bodies. That means you are experienced. So for me, it's a very different understanding because I'm like, oh, you have an understanding of all these different kinds of bodies. So that maybe you probably are better equipped to understand what my body is because maybe you've seen a similar body now or been with a similar body. And I think that's very helpful. Um, I I had a lady on this show on Monday was talking about... Um, she was like, she had a first date and the guy asked her how many people she had slept with. And she was like, well, I'm not going to go on a second date. Um, but she was like, since I'm not going to go on a second date, I'm going to go ahead and tell him, you know? And I was like, (laughs) I was just like, wow, that's a trip. Like, I think it's a, it's a, if you're like, it depends on what kind of attitude you have towards it. Like for me, I will ask because I'm curious. Like, I I wonder how many people, you know, because like, (laughs) I'm just curious. I'm just a curious person, right. but I wouldn't judge right. you. You know, I right. wouldn't base your answer and judge you off of that. You know what I mean? Whereas I know, you know, there's a lot of people who would judge you, you know, um, you know, <laughs> with my wife, you know, it's funny because I definitely asked her, I'm like, you know, how many people have you been with? 
um, you know, and she told me and um, she was like, I am not, I'm never going to ask you that question. <laughs> right, she's and I was like, like, yeah, you probably, you don't have to, that's not a thing, <laughs> you know? Right. right. Whatever you, you know, whatever feels good to you, keep it at that. Um, right. But if you know in yourself, like, you know, you, you might have a little judgment, then asking that question, I mean, and then props to you. If you, if you want someone who's only been with nobody or one person or a few people or whatever, like, it's very interesting because some people, <laughs> the average, the average number of uh, sexual partners a person has in their lifetime is supposed to be around 13. Okay. Now, some people don't know that. So they think, I had no oh, idea. My body count is big. I've been with five people. Like that is big. <laughs> and and I'm just like, ooh, okay. You know, like <laughs> okay, big if shot. That's, if you. that's big to you, you know what I mean? In my head, I'm like <laughs> five people <laughs> in a quarter? No. <laughs> like <laughs> Um, like how long? So, <laughs> you know, it, whatever. So it's just kind of like whatever y you think is 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 good or bad or whatever. But I think people should have that kind of information to know that, like, hey, whoever you sleep with, it doesn't it doesn't matter as long as you are being safe or you are doing the things that you need to do to be a sexually responsible adult, right? So, um, mm -hmm. and it it actually doesn't matter. So if I slept with 500 people you know what i mean like unless unless i am not being safe in some way shape or form that's the only thing you need to know you know what i mean so a lot of i don't a lot of times and i think particularly with religious communities they tend to be like you got soul ties to all these people. No, you don't. Literally my next question. <laughs> like, no, you don't. Like you ain't got no soul ties. I do not have soul ties. I, I, sometimes I don't even remember some of these people. You know what I mean? So like, it, it, it doesn't matter. I love these folks. <laughs> like that I could not possibly have a quote unquote soul tie um, with them. Now there is, there is such thing as the, uh, the DNA. So for instance, mm -hmm. if you are a person who sleeps with, um, cis men and you, um, have semen, like you don't use barriers. So you have semen going into you that actually does affect a little bit of your DNA. Um, oh, wow. so I can, un I can understand that in a sense of people being like relating it to some kind of soul tie, um, mm -hmm. because those proteins, um, do get soaked into your system. It's like, it's like lotion or whatever, right? Like you put yeah. something on your body, it's going to soak through your skin and be in your body. So whatever you put into your body is going to affect it. Um, so oh. same with DNA, um, and someone else's DNA on you or inside of your body. Um, so if you wanted oh, wow. it to talk about it like that, I guess you could, but <laughs> honestly Marvelous, she ain't going for it <laughs> yeah like the spiritual <laughs> aspect of it like ah uh, i don't know about that you know Marvelous, it's a no for me dog <laughs> <laughs> no i did yeah dna that's i didn't even think about it because you know uh I've, that's so funny that you brought it up because that was literally my next question was about to be about the soul tie so i'm glad that you brought it up and, and kind of and, and explained it with the DNA because I didn't, you know, that's really, really interesting. I had, it makes sense, obviously, logically, but I had no idea, you know, because I obviously have heard of soul ties and, you know, and I, I don't know. It's, it's funny. Like I do subscribe to a lot of things, but, you know, I, I also am open to other ideas as well. And a lot of people like kind of look at me crazy for that. Cause I'm like, yeah, like definitely like y'all know, like I tell people I'm churchy. Sometimes I'm churchy, but I also am open to listening to other ideas because that's how it should be. Right. Like you can subscribe to cert. So to one thing, but also like get an understanding of the world. Cause that's how it should be. And so, uh, thank you for, you know, kind of break. I, I love that. Like, you know, if you want to do the soul ties, like, 
you can look at it from a DNA standpoint and do it that way. So that's really dope. Um, so I want to get into how we use sex um, and, and grief and creating un, uh, unhealthy coping mechanisms, right? Um, because when I when my mom passed, <clears throat> I definitely was out here in these streets um, and really just, and really just was in. And I've talked about it before. Like, you know, I had some guys kind of on speed dial and was like, mm-hmm. hey, I need you to come through. And then like y'all can leave. Like and that was kind of my outlet when I started feeling like bad or missing my mom. I would just call them. Right. Um, why do we use that like sex? And maybe it, now listening to you, obviously, it goes back to releasing those kind of feelings of of you know dopamine and things like that but like why is it that it's such a a easy way to to kind of suppress those emotions and that grief um access right so for Mm, you you know you're beautiful you probably have easy access to call somebody and being like come through because i need to make this happen quick right i need those (laughs) release of the hormones um and uh because you could have you could have exercised you know you could have went for you know a jog or a walk you could have yeah. um hung out with your friends or you know did something productive you could have done something else but you went to sex because it, it was easier for you you know what mm-hmm. i mean um uh, because you go bo- go back to thinking like once you have the high, the high is good. But then I'm sure the next day or the day after you're probably like, oh, I'm still feeling some type of way. Yep. or I'm still going through yep. this grief. Now, mm-hmm. I-, I wouldn't. So I wouldn't say it's a sex. It can be used as an unhealthy coping mechanism. I think if you don't know why you're having sex. So, for mm. instance, when you're like, OK. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this because I'm feeling some type of way and I want to feel better. That that's a reason. So as long as you have a reason, I think it's good. Now, when you jump into sex and you're like, I'm just having sex to be having sex. You're really, there's no, there's no reasoning behind it. Um, And that's, that can become unhealthy because you're like, why did I do Mm. that? You'll start to resent, then you'll feel bad about yourself about Mm. for doing it. And you'll go into that, you know, downward spiral. So that is when it becomes unhealthy. So again, it's sort of like knowing why you're having sex is going to be the the reason if you're feeling like I'm feeling some type of way. Oh, I just need it. I just need to suspend that thought. Some people do it with drugs. Some people do it with alcohol. Some people do it yeah. by over-exercising. Some people do yeah. it, you know, however they release whatever their their thing is, um, that is how they deal with it. So, um, like I said, I think it's only unhealthy when you don't have a reason. But otherwise, it's just a coping. It's just another coping mechanism and... Um, and it's it's not bad as long as you are taking care of yourself and you're doing it in a way that that feels good to you and not harmful. Like you are doing it consensually. You're not, mm-hmm. you know, you're expressing your desire and communicating what you want, what you need. Because I know sometimes I because I, I did the same thing when I um I had some uh when I was feeling some type of way about a breakup you know? And I was just like, oh, I'm sad. And when I go through breakups, I get really sad. Like I just stay in bed all day. Like Mm. I'm like a hopeless romantic. So it's just like the end of like the world for (laughs) however long. And so I remember uh, um, this one time when I had broken up, I was just like, I'm going to just peruse Craigslist because I need to get laid. I need, I just need to, I need to let go some of this grief. And uh, you know, I, um, uh, found someone and I was like, this is what I'm interested in. I want to get this. This is, you know, are, is this something that you're, you know, you can do or you're interested in? And so I think communicating that, having an understanding of like, okay, this is what I'm doing and I'm going to, I'm, I'm helping, I'm hoping to feel better for doing this. And, you know, and I did, I did, (laughs) man. Um, and I'm sure you did too. You felt better. Yeah. You felt good, probably relaxed, you know? Right. And then. I was like, thank you. Y'all can leave now. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're like, I got what I needed. And you now... can leave now. Thank you. Mm-hmm. 
Exactly. <laughs> no, that's good though. I love that you said that because I've been in, <clears throat> I love that you said like, it's unhealthy if you don't know the reason why you're doing it. Cause I've been in that space too of like, mm. I'll do it. And I'm like, oh, Lauren, like, why did you do that? Like, you don't even like him. Like, ugh, mm. like, you know, and then I go into this like weird spiral. So, oh my God, I love that. Like, I because, you know, I always am like, because again, like with my mom, that happened with my dad, it happened a little bit, but I use alcohol more so as my outlet, as opposed to like with my mom, it was like, yeah, I'm going to call what's up? Like, can you, like, you already know what it is. Just come on through. Um, but I already knew what it was, but then though, I think after a while when I wasn't processing my grief and really working through that, I just was having sex and didn't really know the correlation. And it was like, why are you even having sex with this man? You don't even like him. Like now he on your phone. Like, okay. So then go have sex with somebody else. Why did you even have sex? Like, you don't even like, you know what I mean? Like not recognizing that you're trying to uh, cope and, and with this grief instead of managing it in a proper way. So that is girl butter right there, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about, um, you know, when you do experience some type of loss, some people do the opposite. They have trouble with having sex, like whether, you know, it's with their spouse, maybe they lost their mom or something. Now they're having trouble connecting with their spouse or their job or whatever, insert the losses. And now they have trouble having sex. You know, so because there's probably some people in here like, that's cool. Like you can go and do it, but I can't like that desire is gone. Like what happens there and how do they even get that that desire back to want to do it? Ooh, that's a that's a difficult one, especially because when we are going through something very, very emotional, um, that is a stressor. So mm. uh, if if you know, if we're going through a loss right? Some of us react like you in a sense of being like, okay, I need to, I need to release. I need to go out. I need to, I need to get these hormones because, or else I'm going to be in a bad place. Right. Mm -hmm. And then some of us be like, are like, oh my gosh, like I am having, uh, I don't even want to think about sex. Sex is the last thing on my mind. I'm feeling some type of way that that is just what we, what's called the, like the sexual inhibitor system. Like there are stressors that basically are saying like, Hey, um, this is too much. And it's putting the brakes on your sexuality. Um, Mm. and to get back to that is really individually. It's going to, it might take some time. It might take some, uh, some release of that, uh, relief of that stress. Meaning that if somebody is going through grief, um, maybe you, and you're like t- supporting that person who is going through the grief and they are like, Oh, you know, their sexual appetite is not there or whatever. That means mm-hmm. you need to maybe find out what they need. Do you, do, do they need to be held? Um, do they need just for you to listen? Do they need you to just talk to them, talk through it, whatever the ways that you can to help bond to them and connect to them, that is going to help release or relieve some of that, that tension and ease them in a way that feels good so that they can have access to their sexuality. Um, but it really is about what they need. Um, so talking to them about what they need, um, uh, you know, maybe they, maybe they need that glass of wine. So you go get the glass of wine, maybe, right. they need, you know, maybe they need for you to take them out and get some sunshine on a walk or whatever it is, giving them what they need is going to help, um, not only help them sort of release some of that, that grief or, um, kind of suspend that grief for that moment. But it'll, like I said, it'll help them to have access to their sexuality a little bit more because of that connection and that oxytocin connection that you bring. Um, so any kind of intimacy vulnerability is going to, is going to make that work. No, I love that. I love that a lot. Cause like you said, especially <clears throat> cause I, I specifically was thinking about, you know, like a husband, wife, duo, boyfriend, girlfriend, or something like that. And it's like, you know, so I love that. Like, I want to talk about that a little bit. Intimacy, because 
I think there's a uh, misconception of what it is. You know, people think about intimacy is is specifically sometimes just the intercourse, and then sometimes like maybe touching or something like that. Can you give some other examples of intimacy outside of that? So maybe somebody who's listening is like, well, they don't want to be touched. They don't want that. And I'm like, that's not just what intimacy is. So. Right. Intimacy is really just dependent on the person, right? So maybe it's cooking for them, right? Mm. Maybe it's uh, just listening to them. Maybe it's reading them a book. Maybe it is um, just sitting in the same room and working from your computer as they're working from their computer, you know? Yeah. Maybe intimacy is you get the remote, whatever you want to watch, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. Or, you know, it could be. It could be whatever is whatever makes you feel close to them. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be touching, but maybe, but maybe it is cuddling, you know, because there's there's physical intimacy and then there's emotional intimacy, right? So physical intimacy, we're cuddling, we're hugging, we're holding hands, maybe we're touching feet, maybe we're just laying next to each other. Um, and that's okay, right? And then emotional intimacy is you know, you being vulnerable, explaining, maybe sharing a secret or sharing um, your thoughts, you know, um, it is, uh, yeah, sharing those emotions, I think, are, are also helpful. Um, but making sure that you really are um, taking whatever situation it is, you know, and taking that in and, and not pushing your own agenda or your own thing onto them. I think that's also really, really important when it comes to grief as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was, as you were talking, I was thinking about something. I was like, oh my God, this is such a good kind of segue into that. Of So maybe there's some couples who are, you know, experiencing some discourse in their relationship. Right. And so they're no longer having sex. They're not really intimate like that. And so maybe a partner's like, how do I, you know, outside of creating the intimacy because this person is mad at me like we only want to be around each other like how do you even get back to that place if it's like intimacy I don't even want to talk to this person like how do I even like get there to to get back to a place of creating this um healthy sexual relationship within our you know marriage or relationship well number one first maybe you need therapy <laughs> But also one. Okay. <laughs> think about, yeah, think about why you got together with them. I think that's the easiest mm. way to access. So you think about how did we get together? And you, you reflect, you tell that story either to yourself or maybe to someone else and be like, you know, we got together. This is a thing that happened. It was so cute and amazing. And I thought they were wonderful. And I did yeah. this and they did that. And, <clears throat> you know, that can help, uh, revive some of those old feelings. I think also um, when you feel some type of way about your partner, um, going back and saying, what do I love about this person actually? Mm, like, that's good. you know, because oftentimes we, we are very critical of our partners because they're so close to ourselves. And if we've been with them for a while, we, we tend to be a little bit more critical. Um, so going back and being like, what do I love about this person? What do I love about you? You know, or what do I love about them? Um, and just start naming things. And once you, once you start naming things that helps you to, to get on the right track. Um, we, we tend to, um, the negative always tends to outweigh like the positive things. So if there's something negative that you're experiencing from your, your lover, your partner, spouse, that means you need to have five positive things for that one negative thing in order for it to keep balance. So, oh, wow. you know, for that, if you're like, ugh, ugh, they, I don't know, never wash the dishes, Right. And you're like pissed off for whatever reason, because you're like, oh, my God, I have to do the dishes every damn day. Why don't you do the dishes? You know? Right. Um, and that negative thing can be like, rah, 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 rah. you have to be like, OK, well, now I got to think of five positive things and then I'm going to feel better because it's going to outweigh that or it's going to be the same. Now, in order for you to outweigh it, right, then you need to have another positive thing. So it's really mm -hmm. about naming that positive thing. But if you keep naming that negative thing, that negative thing, one negative thing, two negative thing, three, that's going to, you're now you're 
you, now you have to keep on building up those positive things. Um, and that's going to be very, very difficult. So I usually stress yeah. like if there's uh, something happening in your relationship and there's like one negative thing, work on that thing first, um, whatever it might be, however you can, you know, negotiate how to make things work um, so that if there's another negative thing, it's not going to weigh as heavy on you. Um, oh, and a lot of times you can mitigate that through physical intimacy. So kissing, hugging, um, touching, cuddling, like all of these different things can actually make you feel better about that. Damn the dishes or the, whatever that <laughs> one negative right. thing is, you know? Right. Oh no, that's good. Cause you know what? I love that. Like you said, thinking of five pauses for this one negative. Cause when I was living with my ex, I just did not, I could not fathom why you would put your clothes next to the dirty clothes hamper when <laughs> like, it, I, it, to this day, like I, I can't <laughs> fathom why you put them next to the dirty clothes hamper when the hamper's right, like you couldn't put it in it, like you know <laughs> what I mean. But like back then, I wish I would have had those five things. And I'm like, I just don't understand why your sock is next to it because you saw it and you chose not to put it in. I, I got questions. <laughs> Someone make it make sense. But like, but then you know, thinking back to it, like we would get intimate that night. And I would forget about the sock, right? Yep. And so, you know, you're absolutely right about that. So, because because what it comes down to is never about the sock or it's never about the dishes. It's always something deeper. So, you know, to her first point, therapy, y'all need that. <laughs> and then, you know, <laughs> y'all need that. And and I love that, like, in that moment, like, try and think of those five positive things to kind of bring you out of that. That's solid, solid. I love that. And so I could talk to you all day, but I'm not going to keep you all day. So. <laughs> Last question. I always love to ask my guests, you know, for someone who's listening to this episode, who may have seen the title and been like, what is this girl going to talk about? You know, um, and really now is kind of like enlightened in a different space. What would you want their takeaway to be when listening to this episode, when it comes to the grief of sex? You know, when it when we're thinking about the grief of sex, I think really being able to take your time and um, understand who you are as a, as a sexual person. I think when you understand yourself as a sexual person, then you know, okay, if I'm going through grief, this is what I need and this is what I don't need. Uh, communicating that to your spouse is going to be key or to a lover. You know, just being like, hey, I'm going through some stuff right now. What I need you to do actually, and this is good. If you just think about this when you're not going through grief or when you're, when you have a pause in a moment, um, uh, I have a, what I call a relationship user guide. It's sort of like when I'm going through this thing or when I'm sad, this is what I need you to do. Um, so mm. understanding yourself, okay, I need you to do this, having them do that thing. Um, that is going to be helpful for your healing. Um, so again, knowing who you are as a sexual person, um, understanding what, what kinds of things that you need, conveying that, communicating that to your lover, partner, spouse, um, and then having them, you know, fulfill that for you can help you with some major, major healing and connection. And we'll, you know, we'll draw you closer together and, and that it, yeah, we'll, it will just help you draw you closer together. Yeah, no, I love that. You're right. Communicating, communicating what you need. Um, you know, and, and again, like kind of back to your point also, I love, you know, for those of us who had moments in our lives where, you know, we just enjoyed sex, <laughs> you know, it, with a lot of people um, to not kind of be hard on yourself because that creates a grief in itself, um, you know, because you think based on judgment, like you said, of people, um, you're supposed to be this, this, this person, this person, place, or thing, just because you had, a, like you said, you had a hoe phase, or maybe you a hoe, and you just living your life and doing whatever. Like, I love that. So, you just had so many good gems. Like, I have a, a wrap up after this, and I'm like, I don't even like. She has so many gems. Like, so because, and 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 I appreciate you being here and just being like honest and being so open. Because again, I think a lot of people are going to look at this and say the grief of sex, like, what is that? And that's why I wanted to talk about it from so many different angles, whether you are using it 
um, in a way to make you feel good or you've created a grief inside yourself because of what society has told you or if you're afraid to have the conversation with your kids. And so I just love you for being here and being vulnerable. So thank you for being here. Um, if they want to reach out to you, if they want to find you, please give us all the info so they can find you. Absolutely. You can go to my website, velvetlipssexed.com. Um, if you want to go to the sex conference that T and I have, it's sexdownsouth.com. Uh, we talk a lot around religion. Uh, we, there's some, been some presentations around grief and sex. Um, you can also text me and join my text list. Uh, that number is 404-737-1364. Um, and you can find me on social media at one Marla Stewart or at Velvet Lips Sex Ed. That's sex without the E um, or at SDS Con on Instagram. So um, yeah, you can find me on all social media channels with all those handles. So. Right, right. I'll put it all in there for you guys because I'm I'm sure people oh. are going to be reaching out like, hey, girl. Yeah. <laughs> and then also, you got to get my book, The Ultimate Guide to Seduction and Foreplay. I yeah, I was say, let's Ultimate see Guide it. Ultimate Guide to Seduction and Foreplay. Yeah, Jess yeah. and I wrote a book. It's amazing. I love it. I'm very proud of it. So make I'm sure you pick of, that up. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, for y'all, listen, she's trying to put y'all on game. Okay. How <laughs> to seduce and your partner and get some foreplay because some of y'all don't know how to do that okay you know what let me let me not let me get into this wrap up but thank you so much again for being here i appreciate it <laughs> yes thank you thank you for having me i'm glad thank you i really 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 hope y'all enjoyed that conversation with marla like that was it was just very enlightening right um and, and you know like i said growing up in a really um I don't want to say we were super religious right but definitely you know going to church and like I said I had a purity ring and all these things and to kind of go into that you know kind of rebellious stage of like woo, sex life you know but not having the education around it uh really caused a lot of grief and turmoil in my own life um you know again going back to that idea of having you know this desire to be married and what my husband asked me and then you know, I have to explain, well, at this time of my life, you know, I was out here in these streets, you know, and so I raked up a lot of partners during that time, right? You know, and so um, just a lot of that and, and, and kind of getting some clarity on that. And um, even when I have kids, like I've always said, since, you know, when, uh, when I got older, and, you know, when I was out here doing things and when I realized I didn't really have the the proper education and a proper relationship uh, with sex. Right. Um, when I have kids like I'm going to have that conversation with them because they need to know, like, because if I don't have the conversation with them, somebody is going to have that conversation with them. And I would rather them want I, I want my kids to be able to come to me and say, hey, mom, hey, dad, like, this is what I'm thinking, like how Marla said her mom was like, you'll know when you're ready when you go to the store and buy condoms, right? Like, I want them to be able to come to me and say like, hey, I've been dating little Johnny here. And I think I'm ready to take it to the next level. I think I'm ready to have sex, you know, and let's talk about that. Like, okay, you think you're ready to have sex. So let's talk about emotions that can happen with that. Right. And, you know, like she said, the oxytocin that can be released with that. Right. Or let's talk about if you don't protect yourself, what that can look like. Let's talk about ways of protection. Are we talking about um, condoms? Are we talking about uh, dental dams? Are we talking about birth control? Are we, you know what I mean? Like, I want to have those conversations. And I know that's probably a little controversial, right? Especially um, coming from someone who is very much vocal about, you know, loving God and, and loving Jesus and the Holy Spirit, right? But at the end of the day, these are the conversations that we have to have because you can, you can tell a child all day not to do something or you can try and shield them and shelter them all day, but the world is still out there. We still have the internet. And um, I don't even know what the internet is about to be by the time, you know, I have kids and they grow up, right? Like I'm thinking about right now, but who knows what it's going to be you know, in 10, 15, 20 years, right? When we're having those conversations with our children. So, you know, I want to be that that uh, safe space, right? I want to create that safe space for my kids to be able to have that conversation. And I also want to be able to have um, conversations with my future husband and say, hey, this was a time in my life that I was doing this and I was doing this because, um, you know, I was grieving and it was my way of coping 
Um, and then there was times when I was just doing it and I didn't recognize that I was doing it because of the grief and not feel judged about it. Right. But feel confident to know that that's the reason of what it was. Right. And to not feel like I'm this terrible human being for doing that, but to know that like, this is what I did. Um, this is who I am. This is where I'm going, but you know, now I'm educated in it. Now I have a healthy relationship with it. Or if we're ever in a situation where, um, you know, somebody has a loss, like how to be able to kind of be there intimately for them emotionally and physically. Right. And same thing, if we're having a tiff, like, you know, how to kind of, uh, bring that back, bring that love back, you know, obviously with therapy and then, you know, with the intimacy part of it. So like, she just, she really just spoke on some amazing things. And so I really hope that, um, it maybe enlightened you in some type of way, or maybe it uh, opened up your eyes, or maybe you were looking at something one way and now you're like, oh, well, maybe I can look at it this way. Or maybe it's like, well, maybe I need to start having these conversations, you know, with whoever, kids, spouse, partner, whoever it is, you know, um, that's the whole point of this is, is I wanted to really have an open and honest and enlightening conversation because this is just like grief such a sex is a taboo topic it is and i understand um coming from a religious background you know how taboo it it is and was for me you know growing up and how even now you know i still struggle with it like you know and so that's why sometimes like if you heard in the uh in the interview, you know, when she was talking about soul ties, right? Like, you know, specifically I was, you know, I was like, I was going to ask you about that. And she brought it to the DNA because at the end of the day, again, I am who I am, but I'm also open to other ideas. And I think that's how we grow as a, as, as a race, as humans, as people, whether it's religion, whatever it is, like just being open um, to hearing that. That doesn't mean you have to subscribe to it. Doesn't mean it's what it is, but like at least be open to it and be like, oh, well, that that makes sense. Like when something makes sense, it makes sense, right? Like, you know, and so being open to that. And so as you're kind of going through this journey of maybe, you know, being more enlightened and opening yourself up to certain things or, you know, trying to kind of release yourself from that grief that maybe you've created within yourself from um, past mistakes, uh, excuse me, not mistakes, from past experiences that you've had with sex or, um, you know, past instances that you may have used it in a way that you were like, I don't, this is not a good way, right? Um, as I always, always say, as I always, always in every episode, be kind to yourself and give yourself grace because if you don't, who will? <laughs> that's it you guys thank you so much for listening to another episode of this too shall suck podcast a fresh perspective on grief if you are not already follow me on social media i also now have a linkedin i have a linkedin um it is actually this too shall suck podcast on there as well you can find me on facebook and instagram as well at this too shall suck podcast on all the socials so follow me guys send me a message i love responding to you guys anyone who sent me a message knows i love responding if you don't have social media, feel free to send me an email at hello at this two shall suck podcast.com. Let me know how this resonated with you or if you have any topics that you want to hear. This episode and every episode is produced by my amazing producer, Mike Sick. And all the original music you hear on this podcast is produced by Jimmy Samaj. As always, guys, I love you all so much. And I'm sending you love and light in your life because you deserve it. I'll see you on the next episode. Mwah. All right, my loves, I hope you all enjoyed that episode. You can actually listen to This Too Shall Suck podcast, a fresh perspective on grief on all listening platforms. And make sure if you're not already, following me on social media, on Instagram and on Facebook, at This Too Shall Suck podcast. And you can hit my website as well. Learn more about your girl, Lauren Denise, at www.thistooshallsuckpodcast.com. If you love this episode, if it resonated with you, make sure you hit that like button. Let me know, because I know I need to make more videos like that for you. And meet me in the comments. Let's talk about it. I love, love, love talking to y'all. And make sure you definitely hit that little, that little bell, that little subscribe button. Thank you guys as always, and I'll see you on the next episode.